cords, we ceased our maddened haste. I wound my arms around his tawny waist. My hand crept up the buckskin of his belt. His knife hilt in my burning palm I felt. One hand caressed his cheek, the other drew the weapon softly. I love you, I love you, I whispered. Love you as my life. And buried in his back, his scalping knife. <laughs> ha! How I rode, rode as a sea wind chased, mad with sudden freedom, mad with haste, back to my Mohawk and my home. Chiefswood. What was left there lives inside walls and seeps through thin paper veneers decorated in styles to please the missus. It rests in dark corners, chases away the crazies before negative messages meet. National Museum of the American Indian Artist Leadership Program, and you've already been through the uh, first part of the, uh, the program, which is coming to the collections. And a couple days ago, you just completed the community aspect. In your own words, how would you describe um, the short term and long term of the community impact? of your project. My goal with this research and with the fellowship um, was to kind of um, bring back uh, Pauline to Vancouver. Um, and as such, uh, there were people uh, in present at the presentation last night who are descendants of um, from, from this territory. And so that was very important to me, that um, that, that aspect was being honored and recognized uh, first and foremost. And then the fact that um, I have the honor of being part of the um, Aboriginal Writers uh, Collective of the West Coast, and having them involved in that presentation was just very um, special uh, for me because uh, this is living, we are absolutely living proof of the path, the literary path that Pauline had carved. You know, she was doing something that we now call spoken word and we recognize as a very popular uh, literary presentation style. Man, she was so ahead of her time in that way. And um, the fact that, you know, I have found uh, success as a spoken word uh, poet myself um, is, is just another one of those parallels. And I was able to, uh, going to the museum and uh, researching her in that way was another affirmation of, of those parallels that exist between Pauline, what she was doing as a writer and a woman, and a Mohawk writer and woman, um, and, and the work that I do today. Contract entered into this 26th day of March, 1906, between Miss E. Pauline Johnson of Hamilton, Ontario, and Mr. George G. High of New York City, New York. For the sum of $500, receipt of which is hereby acknowledged, is hereby acknowledged, Miss E. Pauline Johnson sells absolutely to Mr. George G. High, a wampum belt which has been in her family for the past several years. Mr. George G. High hereby stipulates that at any time before April 1st, 1988. So when she would recite that, that poem that I read last night, this is the knife she would draw up and plunge down into the air. Rate of 6% per annum dating from April 1st, 1906, up to the date of the repurchase of the above belt. Now, could someone tie this on the <laughs> Just to see what it feels like. Vancouver is honored today by the visit of representatives of the noble Six Nations Indians, whose members from the time of the American Revolution War onward have established an inevitable record of devotion to the crown. Vancouver treasures its close association with a princess of this same race, Dega Inwage, who fell in love with our city and chose to make her home here for the final years of her life. 
Known to all Canadians as Pauline Johnson, this poetess and writer of Indian legends has established a lasting reputation. She's the only Canadian literary figure to be honored by the issue of a special commemorative postage stamp. For the last 70 years, her writings have been and are still widely read and appreciated throughout the country. Her books are still being reprinted after running through dozens of editions. What other Canadian writer can claim such lasting proof of popular favor?